Kayla, please like and subscribe. Well, thank you for joining us again for another episode of Canon Conversations. Uh, today, my guest is Rudy. Thank you for coming on, Rudy. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. And so, Rudy, you and I have quite a little bit of history. We've never met in person, but we've been in some of the same communities, some of the same spaces, supported some of the same projects. We have we've we have a lot of the same friends you know, out there. And so I feel like I've known you for going on about three years. Yeah, it's going on. And maybe someday we'll get to meet in person. But I do, it's it's part of this segment is it's twofold. Part of it is getting to talk to people in a one-on-one -on -one situation that I normally don't get to talk to. And then also it's in the title, Candid Conversations. So we can have truthful conversations about whatever. Sometimes that's going to be lighthearted. Sometimes it's going to make you laugh. Sometimes it might make you cry. But today's topic is just a little bit more on the serious side. Uh, today, we are going to talk about human trafficking. And it's something that Rudy is very passionate about. And Rudy is not just in the crypto spaces. She's multifaceted. She's uh, involved with different spaces is on X. I'm sure there's things behind the scenes that she's involved in that we don't really know about. But Rudy, you want to tell us just a little bit about that? Well, first of all, you know, getting to know you guys has been great. You know, I've said in a lot of spaces that with a lot of the ups and downs we've all gone through, the people that are still remaining are the good people in this space, you know, mm -hmm. and fortunately, you know, Holly and I um, and Mima, you know, we've all become very close Holly has been a great influence. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with you. It's my pleasure. Pretty much, pretty much at the beginning, it was just crypto. Um, I think you know that I'm very much about uniting crypto, um, not just being Absolutely. in the ecosystem. It's been very important for me to see projects come together, especially when it comes to bringing new people in. Um, you know, for mass adoption, we need to be one huge community, not just broken off into different chains or different ecosystems. And I've always said that we end up where we are for a reason. And as much as I love doing crypto spaces, I've learned with this advocacy and the fight against human trafficking that I think this is what brought me to crypto. This is what's given me the voice in the spaces because I can now use this platform to educate. And I've seen that a lot, you know, especially lately in the Zap community, the amount of support and people that do come out asking questions, how can I help? What can I do? Um, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It only takes one person to make a difference. And I don't think people realize that sometimes, you know, they say, oh, well, what can I do? Well, I've already made a huge difference. And that's just with my 5,000 followers. That's just, <clears throat> excuse me, that's just with doing eight months worth of these spaces. I've made a difference. People have come to me, you know, wow, I didn't know these things happen. Um, the biggest misconception is the average person thinks human trafficking is that white van that drives down the dark alleys with the tinted windows that just grab people off the street. When in reality, the average person who's trafficked is trafficked by their family or their friends, oftentimes right in their own homes. And that's something that is very important to get out there because what happens is people who are trafficked, when they finally do go for help, they're not believed because even the law enforcement has it in their head that trafficking is just one way. They don't realize mm -hmm the differences and how it's being done nowadays. You know, we have to remember trafficking and I'm trying and I'm trying to stay away from that S word, you know, for the sake of the video, but you know, for the sake of YouTube regulations. Exactly. Trafficking is a $350 billion a year industry just in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. Of that, sadly, 150 billion is just children. Mm. 
these children get brought in so young, and especially the children that come from really bad homes or don't have parents, they're used and abused. And by the time they're 16, 17 years old, they're not as valuable to these people. And what happens is they're forced to then become groomers. We're there now out, you know, going to parties with their friends, you know, trying to get their friends to get involved. And then as they become a little bit, you know, involved more, they, they then become handlers or what's called honeypots, where now they're actually handling these women. And listen, it's men too. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely men that have been trafficked. Um, women are obviously what's discussed the most, whether it's because we are seen more, more vulnerable, but this is something that's being done to everybody. And mm -hmm. it's time that it stops. And the only way it's gonna stop is by people such as myself, who have big mouths um, coming forward and just educating. And it's not always easy to educate. You know, there's many people I've talked to about this who are just like, you're crazy. There's no way things can be done this way. There's no way that a person can be drugged in their own home and not realize it. And sad to say, but they're wrong. It is mm -hmm. done this way. Yeah. And Rudy, I think that you may have a different opinion on this than what I have, but I think this is something that's been going on for a really, really long time. But I think with the age of technology and the internet, that it's becoming more and more obvious and people are being able to tell their story and get things out there. And I mean, I know I've been more aware of it over the last even like two to three years than I ever have my entire life. You would hear things once in a while and it would almost sound like, you know, you're talking about the white van. That's like the movie version, right? But all of that used to always sound that way. Like, oh, that would never happen here. And in preparing for this interview, I looked up some statistics and it said that 27.6 million people are being trafficked worldwide each year. That's insane. That's you know, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't be surprised if that number is a lot bigger. And here's why. Those numbers are only based on who comes forward. Agreed. And I will tell you, I took the lower of the numbers that I found. One of them was up to 50 million is what it had said. So I kind of went with the, you know, if you Google something or you're trying to find information, you get a wide range. So I went a little bit more on the conservative side, but I'm with you. I would not be surprised if it wasn't more. You know, we, Which, we have an issue too with the, with the foster care system. Yes. You know, a lot of people and, you know, I'm not going to say that this is necessarily 100 percent true, but it's called government sponsored trafficking. You know, there is a woman by the name of Tara Lee Rodas, who is a whistleblower for the government. She was responsible for helping place the immigrant children into sponsor homes. And she started doing paperwork. And finally, after a while, she realized she kept seeing the same sponsor name. So she finally checked into it. And this sponsor was an MS-13 gang leader. Mm. And he was being given children. You know, she has said that it's harder to go to an animal shelter and adopt a dog or a cat than it is to become a sponsor of these 85,000 missing immigrant children. Wow. That's insane. You know, you know, Caleb, uh, part of our podcast, he's my real life brother. And he was for many, many years, he was a sponsor and he had children coming in his home with him and his oh, wife. Really? Yeah. And it was a passion of his, but it kind of got to the point where it was mentally draining because most of the kids that he had at his home as foster children had been abused and different things. And I'll never forget. And I, and, and I, hopefully he'll be okay with this story. I'll never forget the story he told me of this little three-year-old boy that he had for, I don't know, three or four or five months. And then the state decided that it was time for him to visit his father again. And as soon as the little boy saw his dad, he like lost control of all bodily functions. Like he, and my brother is a giant and he is the strongest human being I've ever met in my life. And he said it took everything in his being to not pound that guy straight into the ground. Even though he saw nothing happen, he could tell by the reaction of the little boy that his life was hell on earth. And so that is kind of where behind the scenes, those things have become very important to us 
because especially through his experiences that we have seen some of this firsthand. But like I said, it almost seemed like it wasn't as big a deal as what it actually is. If we're talking 25 to 50 million people worldwide, and we're seeing just tidbits of it in the news here and there, and now with X and Facebook and all these different things, you're starting to see more and more that, hey, this is a problem, then I give you all the credit in the world for using your voice to stepping up and saying, hey, let's let's change this. Let's let's figure this out. If nothing else, like you said, let's educate people. And well, that's so the first step in everything, whether it's human trafficking, whether it's crypto, whether it's, you know, animal rights, you know, I'm vegetarian. Um, I have my views and things. You and like I don't agree on that, by the way. <laughs> I know you don't. And I got something on the smoker right now, Rudy. And that's something that I never push on anybody. You know, yeah. if somebody is interested in knowing what, you know, why I became vegetarian, what my reasons are, I will share. But I don't believe that forcing, you know, what I believe about the animal abuse or the farms, I don't believe that's, you know, my place to force on somebody. If people want to ask, then that's fine. Yes. And, and I will say this too, Rudy, that there are certain things in the world and in belief systems, whatever that is, that people are not going to see eye to eye on, right? Mm -hmm. But inherently, we all know that murder is wrong, right? We just, we are born knowing that something like that is wrong. And I believe the human trafficking, and I'm trying to stay away from certain hot button words that you right. two get sensitive about. We all know that that is wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't do wrong things, but this is a topic that you would be hard pressed to find somebody and go, oh, no, I'm cool with that, right? I mean, that's it's one of those worldwide things that no matter what religion you are, what race you are, what gender you are, that we can all agree deep down that this is there's a this is wrong, and those are the type of things that sometimes don't get talked about enough. And so I, when when you agreed to do this, and I thought, you know. Let's get into it. Let's let's see what's out there. You are very passionate about this. I have always thought it's wrong, but never like, how can I fix it? Like, because I don't know where to start. And I think there's probably a lot of people out there like that. There are. And one of the things I've tried to talk about, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Bill Elmore. He's a space host um, on Twitter, and he's actually one of the first people who started giving me a voice. And I've spoken up a few times because there are a lot of, of opinions on human trafficking politically and religion. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to make a lot of these people understand is for the average person who knows nothing about trafficking, if they go into a space and all they hear is, oh, the Dems are doing it, the Dems are doing it, the Republicans are sticking up for it. What happens is, like I'll use my stepmother for an example. The first thing she said is, oh, it's, it's a conspiracy. They're just trying to pin it on the Dems. Now, listen, I do lean left, but I have learned that the Dem the Democrats are not taking the stance that they should be the same way the Republicans have on this topic. But when you start bringing religion and politics into it, when you're trying to make a point as to how bad it is, people get turned off because they're now thinking it's a, it's a political bash. So I'm trying to really educate on that too. Let's get the points out there as to how serious this is and how it's being done. And once we bring these people in, then that's when we can start bringing up, okay, well, this politician is fighting for it. This politician is not. But I, agree I think with you. we need to make them realize the severity of the crime first. Which is why I am super passionate about this segment and having these conversations. Because it's too many times, and I've said this on the podcast before, too many times it goes, well, I feel like, or my belief is this, now I'm not hearing you anymore, right? That conversation stops instead of that's where it starts. Like you would say, I feel like, and I instantly go, oh yeah, no, don't care about feelings, but you know, or you now won't listen to me because you already set your mind on something. That's why we want to have these conversations. And that's why they're not always going to be lighthearted. And this is a very serious topic. I mean, it is affecting millions of people yearly. And there is a lot behind of it that even somebody that would be a quote unquote expert in probably doesn't understand 
all of it because I think it will blow your mind. So I have to ask you, why are you so passionate about human trafficking? Um, we've talked a little bit, a little bit about this offline. There are some people, um, who are aware of why I am so heavily involved. Um, it's hard to get into the whole story because it's, it's a lot to tell. Um, there's a lot of things involved that I don't think some people might be ready to hear, but basically I, I have been trafficked. I was trafficked for 10 years by my best friend who lived with me on and off. She was somebody that I met. She was a flight attendant. And what I have since learned is that career is very much used for trafficking um, in many ways. You know, the flight attendants will be the people who, you know, oversee the unaccompanied children who need to be handed off to sponsors. If these flight attendants are involved, they can hand these children off to MS-13 gang leaders or people who run gentlemen's clubs. I met this person in 2012. Um, she always had trauma and tragedy in her life. It was always something, you know, help me, you know, I'm, I'm involved with a guy and he's assaulting me or they're making me do drugs or they're streaming me online. There was always some kind of trauma and tragedy that she was going through where she needed my help. I was always there for her. I flew back and forth to her hometown um, in Georgia several times to help her, to fly her back to Connecticut, to get her into drug rehabilitation programs, to help her. And what I've learned is this is what these people do. They want to distract you into what they're going through because they don't want you to think about what they might be doing to you. Mm -hmm. And I kind of mentioned this last night in Ghost Space when he was talking about how you want to be there to help people. Yes, you do. But you need to understand that sometimes people are begging for your help for selfish reasons. So in my situation, every time I brought Amanda back home to my home or went to stay with her for a month at a time or was flying around with her on buddy passes, I would find I was constantly falling asleep, whether it was because we would go out to dinner and I'd have a couple of sips of wine, whether it was because we were flying for four or five hours, we'd get back to the hotel and I thought I was tired. I never understood what was going on. I would wake up many mornings feeling drugged, um, bruised. Um, her, her line whenever I was bruised was, oh, well, that's because you're not wearing compression stockings and you're doing a lot of flying. So the altitude is you know, causing bruises. Mm -hmm. And when you're friends with somebody and as ignorant as I was, especially a female, who would ever think a your female friend is putting drugs in your drink or waiting for you to fall asleep to possibly inject you with something or to use chloroform over a cloth. Now there's many things I suspect she was doing that we have not necessarily been able to prove yet. And this is why there are certain things I won't yet talk about. I believe that everybody who comes forward needs their story to be as credible as possible. And if you start bringing in a lot of the what ifs and I think, and this is what I think she did, it takes away from it. Because like I've said to you and everybody I've told this story to, I'm gonna find out there's certain things I'm wrong about. I'm not ashamed to admit it. There's certain things that I think have been put in my head from paranoia where I've developed my own idea of how certain things happened that I might find did not happen that way. What I do know is she was drugging me. Um, she had full access to my home. So she was able to come in and out of my home. You know, I'm a heavy sleeper. And when I first found out, um, things were really going bad when she moved out of my home in 2019. My health was going downhill. I was waking up not remembering prior days. I was waking up not realizing where I was. I always had tingling in my face and my lips. My vision was going bad. I was having severe head pains, I never knew why. So I was back and forth to the hospital constantly. And of course they were finding reasons to diagnose me because you know they would ask me questions. Are you doing drugs? Um, have you been with a man? 
And I was always saying no. So of course, if I'm saying no, they need to figure out, okay, well, if these aren't the reasons that's causing this, we need to figure it out. So there was a time frame where I lost about five days. Um, I was wow. in my home. When I finally woke up and got out of bed, my dog had pooped and peed all over my house. I walked out to my dining room and I put my cat's food dishes on my dining room table to keep them up high enough where my dog can't get to it, but still low enough where they can reach it. And I put it on a runner and I walked out to the dining room and there were maggots everywhere, all over the food dishes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my initial thought was because during this time, I wasn't taking care of myself well. I was high and I didn't know it. Um, I was taking Adderall. I did also have tramadol for pain because I'm not one to take things like Oxy. Um, I was abusing the, the Adderall at times. You know, I'd get a 30 day supply. I'd run out in about 20 days. So there were definitely days I was doubling up, mm -hmm. but not where I should have felt how I did. I mean, I felt like I was always almost like on acid. Things in my house seemed like they were moving. Um, I was very jittery. My moods were off. I would snap or cry over anything. And what I've realized is she was using legitimate things in my life against me. So for example, I was on steroids for my, what happened was after those five days, I went to the hospital and I had severe head pains and you can actually see, I have the scars, you know, on the side, I had biopsies done on the temples and they diagnosed me with something called giant cell temporal arteritis because the blood wasn't passing through the arteries, right? And it's an autoimmune. They put me on steroids and I blew up like a balloon. I mean, I was 85 pounds heavier than what I am right now. Just wow. blew up. And when I came off of these steroids, I became very emotional, very depressed, um, sat in my house just crying. I talked to the pharmacist. The pharmacist did say, listen, steroids can do that. It's actually been known to make some people suicidal. But what I think was being done now is I think I was actually off of whatever drugs they were giving me as well. So I think I was withdrawing from more than one thing. And this is, you know, these people are smart. They use the things in your life. You know, one of the first things they do is isolate you. So I have a very close relationship with my family, but it can become toxic. So what Amanda would do is, oh, you know, I can't believe they're treating you this way. I can't believe they said this. I can't believe this. You know, I can't believe that. You know, I, you know, I'm so glad I'm here with you because I would never treat you that way. You know, mm -hmm. I know you trust me. I love you so much. And you believe her. You know, you you believe these things. You have no reason not to. And you probably at some level want to. You want to believe these things. Absolutely. Um, I had always been heterosexual in my my entire life. Um, I did end up in about a six month relationship with Amanda. Uh, looking back, I think she put a lot of effort into making me believe I was in love with her. Mm. I still have compassion for her. I've told everybody this, including the police. I do believe she's been a victim. Um, she had an aunt that she talked about often that was supposedly in a convalescent home and supposedly died in 2021. And it turned out this aunt did not die. She actually lived on the street behind me. And coincidentally, the day my house went under contract for me to sell it, she listed her house for sale, which I'm still very angry with the police because they don't seem to think that's a very big deal. So my belief now is that she was born into this life. Um, she was an escort, to my knowledge, from age 19 on. It is something she hinted to very often. It's things that she's told stories about that really lead me to believe that but she never came physically out and actually admitted it, you know? So I don't want to make that accusation a hundred percent, but based sure. on what I've learned, I do believe that is the case. So basically what happened is I spent about a month with her. She was always bringing me to people's homes. A couple of the times we went to homes that were vacant and she would tell me, you know, oh, well, this person just moved in. They don't have their furniture yet. And then there was this one woman um, that went by the name of T who she said T's girlfriend was in the bedroom and that's why the bedroom door was closed and that's why I heard noises. Well, again, I had no reason not to believe that. Right. I ended up falling asleep while I was there. I woke up four hours later, very confused. Um, I had cramping. Um, at that point, it was prior to my hysterectomy. I did have fibroids very bad. 
So I wrote it off as that being the reason why I was having these pains. Looking back now, I'm able to piece everything together. What these people do is they tell you what they're doing and they do it for two reasons. Number one, they want to test your memory. They want to mm -hmm. see if you, re you know, recall anything about what's happened, but they also in their sick way feel that if they're telling you these things, they're avoiding bad karma. So mm -hmm. they could always say, oh, well, you know, we warned her she didn't take it seriously. And that kind of goes to an audio that I have. Um, Amanda did come and visit me in 2021 for about six weeks. The first couple of days she was there, I believed she was high. She was acting very, very crazy, very paranoid. Um, and I recorded her because she kept threatening that she was going to leave. And I said to her, you know, if you leave, I'm taking these recordings and I'm sending them to your mother because somebody needs to look out for you. Otherwise, you're going to end up locked up in psych. Mm -hmm. So she knew I was recording her. And I have about nine to 11 hours of these recordings. A lot of them are just silly, her and I fighting. And basically what I know now is she was trying to break me down mentally, tr trying to really wear me out. But some of these recordings she's actually saying, and I've made a 37 minute clip of one of the recordings where she's literally telling me what's being done. You know, mm -hmm. men came into the home the night prior, they drugged us. She's like, don't you remember feeling the bed shake? No, Amanda, I don't remember anything. Oh, don't you remember them coming in? No, I don't. Oh, well, they came in with the production studio. What do you, what do you mean, Amanda? There was no production studio here. Nobody came into the house. Um, well, didn't you hear them in the attic? Don't you know they were in the attic? Um, and I'm just replicating her paranoia the way she spoke. And don't you know they were in the attic? You have attic people. I got to the point where it's like, no, Amanda, I have ghosts. Because who's going to think anybody's up in the attic? Right. Um, so I do believe what she was probably doing is when I was asleep, letting people in and then letting them be able to come down from the attic or come up from the basement. You know, I, I don't know. We would see men walking out of my yard early in the morning or later at night. And she'd always point it out again, extremely paranoid. Now, if I saw these things on my own, yes, I would have thought something was weird. But when somebody comes up behind you freaking out, oh my God, what are they doing? What if they broke in? What if they were in the house? Again, it's, Amanda, you're being paranoid, or what drugs are you on? Now, something I have learned is when people go through this, they're tortured, tortured to the point where they try to break off somebody mentally into different personalities. And what it is called is DID, Disso Dissociative Identity Disorder, which used to be known as multiple personalities, split personalities. And this is done to be able to have part of the brain block out what's been done, other parts of the brain be more evil, other parts of the brain be more compassionate. And I said to her for years, I believe you have split personalities. Um, after going through a lot of this, there was about a three week span in May of 2022 where I knew something was wrong. Um, I would wake up, I would find my slider door open. I'd wake up, I was bruised. I was completely out of it. My family, my friends were telling me, you're high. I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. One of my friends came to my house and saw white drip marks going down my sofa and made a comment knowing at that time, she's like, why do you have that dripping down your sofa? And again, I'm trying to avoid certain words. Absolutely. And I appreciate I that. I laughed at her and I said, you're crazy. I haven't been with anybody. You know, it must be Abby's dog drool on the sofa. And I went and took a rag and wiped it up because when you don't know that you've been with anybody, you don't have any reason to think that that's what's on your sofa. Why would you ever suspect that? Yeah. Exactly. So things were very strange. Um, I was hearing a lot of noises. There were times. And what's fortunate in my case is, as you know, I'm a talker. I'm also a texter. So I was constantly texting people saying, you know, I'm smelling cologne in my house. I'm smelling cigarette smoke. Like even my mom remembers me telling her that I was constantly smelling cigarette smoke in my home. And I remember saying to her, do you think it's possible that the old people who lived here maybe smoked and masked the odor and now it's starting to come back out? Um, I would find cigarette butts in front of my house. Just a lot of weird things. I had an elderly woman who lived across the street who I believe was 94 at that time, who would say to me, you know, um, I'll stick to my name, Rudy. She would say to me, you know, Rudy, you had company last night? I'm like, 
No, Helen, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. I saw men coming in through the basement. No, Helen, I didn't have company. Wow. Wow. Or, you know, oh, what happened last night? I saw you being dragged out of your car and you yelling, holding onto the steering wheel. No, I'm not going to go. Again, no, Helen, that never happened. And no memory of it. That's no scary. Memory. Yeah. A lot of things I remembered as dreams. So, for example, there was one night Amanda had said to me or during the day, you know, let's go to a strip club tonight. And I had never been to one. And hey, listen, you want to go, go. So I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go. She was putting a little makeup on me before, you know, I ended up going to sleep because I kind of chickened out at the last minute. Like, no, I don't want to go. And she was putting makeup on me. The next morning I woke up, the makeup was gone. And she said to me, oh, we had so much fun at the strip club last night. And vaguely in a dream, I remembered a strip club. So, you know, I was kind of, this sounds sick, but I was kind of like, oh, you know, Amanda and I are so in sync that she kind of knows what I'm thinking. And I know that sounds crazy to say now, but when she was constantly saying things that I dreamt about, you know, you start to wonder how does she know these things? So I'm like, no, we did not go to a strip club. Oh, yes, we did. No, we didn't. And then, you know, this little malicious laugh and she's, oh, I'm just kidding with you. Like, okay, and this happened often. Men came over the other night or men came in our hotel room. No, they didn't. And she'd push and push and then just laugh it off and say, well, I'm only kidding. On June 2nd of 2022, I woke up completely bruised, pretty much all over my body, all over my arms, all over my wrists, my upper thighs. Um, I was bleeding from places I should not have been bleeding. I was still kind of thinking as I walked out of my room, like, oh my God, what have I done to myself? Did I hurt myself? Because with giant cell temporal arteritis, there is a very slight chance a person can start getting early onset dementia. Mm. And Amanda did put that in my head that that's what was happening to me. So I got to the point where I was afraid to tell anybody that I was losing my memory or losing my time because I was afraid my family would try and stick me into the hospital. Think Lose that I freedom. wasn't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And as I walked out into the um, living room, I saw my dog and her mouth was bleeding. And at that point I knew I did not hurt myself because I did not hurt my dog. Then I started realizing, sorry. On cue, on cue. Then I started realizing that my dog was giving me signs. You know, I would wake up in the morning and she'd be shaking. I mean, just shaking uncontrollably. And she always sleeps with me. So I'd wake up and she wasn't in bed with me and I'd be yelling, you know, Abby, Abby, Abby. Take, it would take her a while and then I would go out, you know, she'd be there. She'd either come to me in bed and she'd be shaking or I'd go out to her and she'd be shaking. We'd go out for a walk. We'd come back to the house. She'd refuse. She would not want to go back in and she'd stand there sniffing. Wow. She was giving me signs. Yeah. And that morning when I found her mouth bleeding, I knew. But at that point, I finally put pieces together and I called my med doctor. She was the doctor who, she's an APRN. She was a doctor who was prescribing my Adderall. Coincidentally, she was also Amanda's doctor. Amanda kind of, you know, not pushed mm -hmm. me, but recommended I go to this doctor. Now, this doctor and I had a great relationship, you know, great relationship. And I called her. I said, listen, I have been assaulted. I need to get to the hospital. I don't think I can drive. I feel like I've been drugged. I can't really sit down. Um, I'm completely bruised. And she was very compassionate. She's like, okay, do you want me to call 911 for you? I said, yes, please. She did. The police showed up with a crisis nurse. And the, obviously the ambulance followed. They brought me to the hospital. And once I got there, I was told I was papered for three days in psych. I said, why? Well, you're paranoid and you're delusional. No, I'm not. I'm confused. Which was your fear all along. Majorly, because what people have to understand is when a woman or anybody is assaulted, they're being held against their will. Right. Um, and when you go to a hospital, which is supposed to be your safe place, calling the police is supposed to be your safe place. They're supposed to be there to protect you, not make your situation worse. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the hospital and they held up the paper, told me that they refused to do a... I'm not sure the right way to say this using the wrong, not using the right words, but an exam kit. There you go. For DNA. 
Um, they refused to do it. I said, why? You're crazy. I said, no, I'm not. Please give me an exam. No. And what bothers me with this is, it's fine. You want to think I'm crazy? That's fine. Then prove it. Yeah. Do the kit. Do the exam. And when it comes back finding nothing, say, okay, see, you're crazy. They wouldn't do it. Instead, they wheeled, they wheeled me back to a dark section of the emergency room, a darker, I should say, like a dim down section of the emergency room, which was cold. They took my purse, they took my phone, and they left me by myself. And I mm -hmm. sat in there crying. And the nurse came in and I said to her, I said, do you understand that I haven't even been hugged yet? I said, I woke up this morning realizing what's been done to me. I immediately called for help. And this is the way I'm being treated. I said, I haven't even received a bit of compassion. Not, are you okay? Can we get you some water? Like, can we do something for you? I said, I've been treated like a criminal and a crazy person from the moment I got here. And the nurse was very sweet. You know, she reached out and she said, can I hug you? I said, yeah, please. A little while later, the psych nurse came down. I will always be grateful for her. She sat and she listened to me for probably close to a half hour. You know, my time frames are a little off. I was still high. I was still manic. Um, drug tests did come back negative. Um, I do believe that the things they were doing were things more along the lines of fentanyl, xylazine, GHB, yeah. the things that only have a three to six hour life in your system for, for being tested. But this nurse sat and listened to me and I can still hear her words when she walked out of that little you know room and she said to the nurses, this girl's not crazy. She's confused, but she is not crazy. She said, I am going to go back in and offer her a urine sample of which she did. I very easily volunteered for that. About maybe 15, 20 minutes later, give or take, maybe 30 minutes, she came back in and she told me that the urine sample did come back thick and creamy with high levels of protein in it. And she said that it absolutely su supported the fact that I had been assaulted. Now here is where probably one of my biggest regrets is. She did ask me at that point if I wanted to spend the night and they would make sure to do an exam kit the next morning at about 9 a.m. And what I said to her is, will you be here? She said, no, I will not. I said, can you guarantee that the next psych doctor or nurse will let me go home and not keep me on this three-day paper? She said, unfortunately, I cannot guarantee that. It will be up to the next doctor or nurse. And I said to her, well, then send me the hell home now. Send me home. I'm not, I'm not going to be held hostage. What these people need to understand is, okay, you hold somebody in psych, but what you're also now doing is preventing them from taking care of their pets, preventing them from being able to work. If you can't work, how are you maintaining the roof over your head? So it becomes a domino effect. Would I have that in some way loved to have stayed in the hospital for three days at that point to have cleared my head and felt safe and be able to go to sleep and not worry about something happening? Absolutely. In a way I would have, mm -hmm. but it would have caused a domino effect in my life. So I went home. And the sad thing about that is, and I know this sounds gross, but I hadn't showered for three weeks. For three weeks, I was so out of it and missing days that I wasn't taking care of myself. If that exam kit was done, the amount of DNA that would have been removed from my body would have probably allowed for a rest to happen right away. Instead, nothing was done at the hospital. The Waterbury Police Department refused to collect evidence. They refused. They wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't meet with me to give a statement Everything basically was not that they ever used the words, you're crazy, but basically that's what they led me to believe in the way they were handling it. I used every resource possible. I called the FBI. I called the national, um, the national agency that handles these kinds of assaults. Mm -hmm. um, I reached out to a place called Safe Haven, which handles women who have been assaulted in these ways. And eventually with going through counseling with my therapist, who I still meet with weekly to bi-weekly, um, we have since moved to kind of bi-weekly unless something comes up. 
um, and with the therapists at Safe Haven who were, you know, experts in these fields, finally the supervisor was like, listen, we believe you. This has happened. You are not crazy. And then with her help, we finally did get an interview with the detective. We sat down with the detective. Um, I will leave her name out of it for right now because I do know that sometimes people can reach out and I'm not looking for her to be attacked in any way. Um, she, was a, she was a new detective. She was actually promoted pretty much right after this all became a case. And I do believe if it were up to her, things would have been done a lot differently. But unfortunately, her superiors were men. They didn't believe me. Um, do I believe that there may be certain things going on that push them to try and keep this case from moving forward? You know, when you see a lot of these busts that happen on the news, you see that pharmacists are involved, politicians are involved, you know, uh, yeah. police officers, you just never know. And I'm not going to make that accusation. So it took months for us to get in front of the detective. Now, during these months, I was continuing to be assaulted. But I was afraid to call nine one one. Well, Why they had. Call? I'm sorry. They had, let, they had let you down at some level. I I don't blame that you at all for that. Because I was just thinking as you were telling that story, is you went to the place that you should have felt safe, that they should have taken care of you, and they didn't. I mean, I won't say they failed one hundred percent, but they dropped the ball in a lot of different places. So now, where's that safe place? Safe place. So. There's yeah. not. And the police who should be there now again. And, and, you know, this is something I do have another Twitter profile. Um, and, you know, I, I will disclose it now. It's called human trafficking awareness. Originally, the handle is C-A-H-T. And yes, I use the 32 um, C-A-H-T 32. And what it was originally supposed to stand for is crypto against human trafficking, because at that mm -hmm. point I decided I wanted to educate crypto. But unfortunately, you know, when people like Safe Muniolo decided to make NFTs to raise awareness for trafficking, and I saw how people were attacking her and I over it, I decided I was not ready to be attacked in the crypto space. So I changed the name to Human Trafficking Awareness, um, and that's where I started really becoming vocal in these spaces. There's a podcast called Dark to Light, which is run by somebody by the name of Relentless Mikey, Mama Patriot and a girl by the name of Ashley that we've become pretty close. They started giving me a voice um, that started getting me involved with, like I said, Bill Elmore, um, Shepherd's Watch, um, you know, all these different organizations. And the more they started hearing my story, the more they realized, okay, this girl needs help. And I, like I said, I was, I'm sorry, because I do tend to jump around with this because there's just so much that's happened. No, and that's okay. Yeah. That's, it's your story. I, nobody can tell it but you. So that's okay. I know that I was still being assaulted during these times because I was still waking up. Um, there were four specific things that I would have to know existed for me to know I was, I was assaulted. One was I needed to wake up feeling drugged. I needed to wake up feeling certain pains, you know, down below. Um, there was also a distinct odor that I'd started to notice and my balance would typically be off and my dog would absolutely start showing signs. So there were many times I woke up thinking it was possible I was assaulted, but I didn't have all four of those things. And if I didn't have all four of those things, I wouldn't tell anybody that I believed it happened. Gotcha. Once we met with the police, which I don't remember what month this was. I was assaulted again pretty bad in November of 2022. That time I did call the police. I did go to the hospital and they did do an exam kit at that point. Now I lied when I went in for triage, when they asked me what happened, I stated that my ex came over to the house. We had a glass of wine. I passed out and this is how I woke up. And I had to do that because if I said, oh, I don't know who it was. I don't know how they got in. I don't know what happened. I was afraid of being thrown right back into psych. Mm -hmm. So once the, um, uh, I believe it's called a Saki nurse, um, they're trained in doing these kits. Okay. Once she came in before she did the kit, she did say to me, what happened? Well, at that point I gave her the real story. Well, that kind of worked against me because she said, oh, well, 
that's you're changing your story now. I need you to speak with psych to make sure that you're competent to approve this exam kit. I said, okay, met with psych, psych felt I was fine. They did the kit. The results came back the end of February. I received an email from the detective stating I needed to come in to make an official statement. She wouldn't tell me over email what was found. So when I got to the police department, I was literally sick to my stomach. And I remember as she let me into the main door for the detective, you know, area, you know, I remember her saying to me, you know, are you okay? And I looked at her, I said, I don't know. And we sat down and there's four areas that are tested. One is, was there DNA found that was not mine? Mm -hmm. That came back as yes. Then it was, was there DNA found that was male? That came back as yes. Or so, I'm sorry, it's three things. Um, the next is, does this DNA match anybody into the, in the national CODIS database? Unfortunately, that was a no. Now, the sample was small. So when there's larger samples, they're allowed to then do a genetics test where they basically run it through kind of like doing um, what's a 23andMe and those yeah. other things where you can see what that DNA relates to. The advice I got from the detective who the advice also came from the state lab was let's not risk wasting what's left of this sample. Let's hold on to it until there's a suspect. Okay, great. You know, but how do we get a suspect? We need to know who this person is. Guess so from that too. point, I started asking if I could give descriptions of the men that I think may have been involved. Could you check the men's flight history that I believe Amanda might have brought to Connecticut because they are men's names she often mentioned? Well, no, we can't do that. Well, why? Well, because we don't have probable cause to go after these men. Okay. Well, can you process my bed? Can you process my slider door? Can you process the stain on my sofa? Well, no, we can't do that. Why? Why can't you do that? Well, it's old now. We can't, you know, if we find DNA from John Smith, we can't say what date John Smith assaulted you. I said, but it doesn't matter. If John Smith's DNA is on my bed, he assaulted me. It's as yeah. simple as that. Oh, well, we can't do it. Then I was assaulted again. It happened to still a couple more times because I think what was happening was the people involved knew the police weren't doing anything about it. And this is why police need to become more educated because wow. these criminals are brazen because they know they can be. They refuse to take the prints. They refuse to process clothes I was wearing. Um, I even had certain wipes that I used in the bathroom um, and saved those as gross as it sounds, but I saved them in hopes that they would ev eventually be able to process it. They would not. Happened again, called the police. Um, I felt like I had a fairly decent, respectable relationship with the detective at that point. Um, I think you know me, I'm very blunt and vocal. She saw humorous sides of me and there are times I make jokes out of this. Yeah. I think it helps me get through it um, many times. But so there was another time I was assaulted and I called the police, I was brought to the hospital and I immediately asked for the DNA to be processed. So they couldn't later then say, mm -hmm. oh, well, it's too old. They then said to me, the detective said to me, okay, I will speak with my supervisor about getting, you know, a crime scene unit or whatever they're called over to the house to process, you know, for evidence. I said, okay, great. Shortly after I get an email from her that states, my supervisor said it's not necessary because we already have DNA from the exam kit. I said, well, how isn't it necessary? This has happened to me multiple times. Chances are by multiple people. And the DNA sample is too small to do the genetic testing. So why wouldn't you want more DNA? Why wouldn't you want to process a larger sample or multiple samples? What if John Smith's sample comes up and that same John Smith sample matches three other women's yeah. kids? So it's not just that they failed me, but they failed every past, present and future victim. I had dreams that I know weren't dreams where I heard another woman crying. Amanda, when I met her in 2013, told me and a very close friend of mine who I won't name, who was a New Haven police detective at that time, 
She told us both that she knew a family in Griffin, Georgia, whose name I will still leave out of it, um, who ran a cult-like ministry out of their home and that they smuggled Asian and Mexican children for child porn. I didn't believe her. Who would? Yeah. So we just, you know, Amanda, you're paranoid, you're crazy. And my friend, you know, what drugs is she on? I'm like, I don't know. Well, looking back now, I firmly believe that she is in so deep with some type of trafficking ring where, yes, children are involved. I don't care if I get justice for me. I want justice for others. And what upsets me is the amount of evidence that has been collected on my own photos of me naked, photos of me passed out, photos of me being held up with a hand behind me where people are zooming in on stretch marks on my body, um, pictures of me where I look like a complete zombie. These photos weren't taken by me. Um, names of people involved, production companies that she stated are involved. My Three of my closest friends are retired New Haven cops and two of them have stated this is evidence one individual piece by itself is not but when you put it all together it is and they've also said that sadly and i'm not going to say that the female detective who handled my case is is like this but they said sadly many police officers just become cops nowadays because they want the pension that they don't want to do the work mm -hmm. to investigate they want the evidence plopped in front of them where they can just, you know, solve the case. They don't want to- Close cases, easy, yeah. Right. They don't want to take the time. So I spent years piecing this evidence together. There are a lot of things that took place that are technology-based that I'm not going to get into right now. However, I have spoken with people. There is a female that you and I both know very well who knows a lot about tech and knows people involved in tech. And she and I had a conversation about a week ago for- probably close to five hours. And everything that I said to her that I was afraid may still be far-fetched, she's like, Rudy, it can happen. It can be yeah. done in five minutes. Those are things I think I'll probably save to discuss when it's more of a group setting where I can have these more professionals there to be able to explain how it's done because I know how it was done, but I can't explain it in tech terms. So after all these times, the police refused to get the evidence. They refused to speak with the 96 year old neighbor across the street who is now passed away, unfortunately. Yeah. But the 96 year old neighbor told her neighbors everything. And those neighbors want to make statements. They want to, they wrote everything down that they were told, please refuse to do it. Finally, the detective, the detective, I, I do believe in my heart, the detective fully believed me. She did decide to make a file and bring it to the state's attorney. Now, we both knew there would not be enough evidence to warrant arrests at this point. I was not expecting the state attorney to say, OK, we're going to go arrest Amanda and her. I joke and I call her her dead on Pam or even her mother that I do believe was also involved. And even if her mother was only involved where it comes to lying for her and protecting her, but she's still there's um, still knowledge. Exactly. So they wouldn't interview these people. Now, the morning I woke up, June 2nd, somehow this 94-year-old woman heard a female voice say, oh my God, she knows, she found out everything, she's going to the hospital. How did she hear that? Mm -hmm. My belief is, I cannot prove this, my belief is that they may have been in her house because she was so you know, old and frail, it is possible they were in her house. She did tell us there were times she woke up to people in her living room. We didn't believe her. You know, we just thought everything was crazy. Um, wow. So I begged the police to interview these neighbors. They did not. The most that they did was ask some neighbors if their video cameras picked up anything, which they didn't. And I don't know how much you're aware of tech, but there are things called signal jammers. Yep. where you can literally jam people's cameras and Wi-Fi. And one of my neighbors was constantly calling Comcast because their Wi-Fi was going out throughout mm -hmm. the night. Um, I will say when you're talking about a $350, $350 billion a year industry 
for people to think that they're not paying people to go work for Comcast, ADT, Verizon, they're crazy. Of course mm-hmm. they're paying them. So when we went, to, when she brought the case to the state's attorney, the state's attorney was willing to meet with her. And I remember saying to the detective, is this a good sign? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, it is. She said, but please know that sometimes it can take weeks to get through a file of an easy case. She said, because I sent the detective many emails with things that I considered proof. I'm, I'm sure you did. For yes. what I know, Rudy, I'm sure you did. Yes. So she said, and your file is extremely big. She said, so we're going to need to give her some time. I said, okay. Never heard anything. And then all of a sudden I got what I've been calling a dear John email from the detective stating that there was no probable cause to take things any further. I said, what do you mean there was no probable cause? And it became a, a battle. She still hasn't given me her exact reasons as to why she no longer felt there was no probable cause to pursue this. Mm-hmm. I did have a lawyer through the Office of Victim Services in Connecticut, really amazing woman. She specializes in this. She did fight for me to get an interview with the state's attorney. And that took place right about my birthday in March. So probably the third week of March, we had that interview. Of this year? Of this past year. Okay. Yes. The state's so attorney. It's taken a while. It's taken a while. The state's attorney wouldn't even look me in the eyes through the camera. She constantly rolled her eyes. And her all she kept saying is, well, there's no probable cause. There's no evidence. And I was getting so fr- I said, how can you say there's no evidence when you guys refuse to collect the evidence? Mm-hmm. You cannot say after I have emails from the detective stating we don't need to collect the evidence because we already have DNA from your kid. So how are you now going to say there's not enough evidence? If you came to collect it, there would have been. I had a brand new bed, brand new. It was bought in 2019. I hadn't been with anybody romantically on that bed. They refused to process it, refused. But then they want to say to me later on, there's not enough evidence to move forward. What I have found out in dealing with different people is you would think that if a woman goes to the hospital claiming they were assaulted, you would think that an exam kit would be mandatory, would be law. The norm. It's not. The doctor has the right to make that decision. And that now needs to change. So I am working on a bill that consists of things like making exam kits mandatory when a victim goes into the hospital. If they want to think they're crazy, that's fine. Then do the kit so you can then come back at a later date and say, see, you imagined it. Um, I also believe that blood work needs to be done the moment the victim goes into the emergency room. And the reason why is the average ER wait could be a couple of hours. So now you're waiting for to be called up, you know, to admissions. You're then waiting to see triage. You're then waiting to get brought back to a room before the blood tests are done. It's now four, five, six, if not more hours, depending on yeah. when you're going. The drugs are out of your system by then. Mm-hmm. You need to get these tests done immediately. And then I am also fighting for it to be mandatory that an evidence scene be processed. I'm sorry. There was no reason, no reason at all. They could not have processed my bed. I ended up buying a black light and shine the light on my mattress. The staining on my mattress is disgusting. When I moved, I pretty much left everything behind. Now, I always wanted to eventually come to Florida, but I'm here now because I can't trust my police. I owned a home in a city. I'm 54 years old. I had never been arrested. I had never been, you know, known to be crazy, known to be on drugs, um, none of that. I've held down the same career since 2003 of a real estate appraiser, never had complaints against me. I have the same friends since high school or my late 20s. I'm not the person that you would say, okay, she's crazy. Three of my closest friends were New Haven cops, um, but they would not give me any credit none whatsoever. It was easier for them to continue to think I was mentally unstable. 
And yes, listen, I appeared unstable. I was drugged. I was confused. I didn't know what was happening. But mm -hmm. again, do what you should do to prove that I'm not stable because the amount of evidence that I still have, you know, before I moved, I spent three hours in my room with a razor blade and ripped the entire top layer off of the king size bed. Now, have I technically tampered with evidence? Yeah. It may not ever be able to be used in a court of law, but as technology advances as, and as I meet more resources, I know we will still be able to get that tested. So whether it's, yes, we're testing it and one man's DNA was found or 20 men's DNA was found, that will eventually help my, my, my case. I'm never giving up. There is no statute of limitations on these kind of crimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a fighter and I have a huge army of people surrounding me that are determined to make me see justice. Some say, well, if things are that bad, why are you still alive? A couple of things I'll say to that. And people like Crypto Mima might actually beat me up after she hears this. But she part might. Of, part of me does not necessarily believe a thousand percent that Amanda is fully evil. I do believe she's been victimized. I do believe she suffers from DID. And I believe, and if you heard the 37 minute clip of her, she does break down saying people will come after her. When people are being trafficked and they go for help, any crimes they commit while being trafficked can't be used against them. I did not know that until we talked yesterday. Yeah. So this was something that I did try to tell her a year and a half ago. Please come forward, not just for my sake, but I don't want to, you know, listen, we've, you, you've heard it, you know, Holly, Mima, I still am on the fence sometimes as to how guilty John is, you know, Bruno, I still try to find the good in people. Mm -hmm. So when the day comes that Amanda does go on trial and if she's sentenced to prison, I know that that's going to be hard on me to live with for the rest of my life because I will always have the what ifs. What if she was crying out for help? What if I didn't brush everything off as, oh, she's crazy? What if, you know, I didn't miss this? You know, you know, I would always say to people, I feel so safe in my home. Um, but clearly I didn't because I was sleeping with a knife and mace under my pillow. But right. yeah, so clearly subconsciously, I knew I was not safe in my home. But I don't want to have to live with the guilt, whether she deserves it or not of her possibly spending the rest of her life in prison. If it was in a perfect world, I would love for her to come forward, admit what was done to me and be somebody to help in this fight. Let her confirm how these things are being done. Let her confirm suspicions I have as to different ways I was knocked out of my home. Let her confirm how these production companies operate. Um, and that's my wish. In a perfect world, would I love 10 years down the road for her and I to be booking conventions where we're there from the um, predator side and the victim side, educating people? Yes, I would. But I know it's not going to happen. And every time my case does move, seem to start to move forward again, or we're doing something like we're doing now, I start feeling guilty. You know, is this going to be that one interview? Is this going to be that one space that triggers one person to hear it where they then say, you know what? I know someone in the FBI or I know someone here. We're going to get justice for you. So every time I take another step forward, I then question, do I want to do this? Because what is it going to do to Amanda? I got to stop thinking that way. Yeah. I need to learn somehow. I don't want to say to hate her because hate can be a very destructive thing for somebody to live with. But separate, separate that. Yeah. 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 You so, know, Rudy, I was just going to say real fast because I know that this is super emotional for you. And we've talked off camera <clears throat> that this is not going to be oh. like the typical interview and things like that. But from the things that you had told me yesterday, one of the things, and 
and I, I do want this to go out there that we talked about this would might be the interview that you told your story. But also remember one of the reasons that you told me that you wanted to tell your story was to help other people that might be going through the same thing. I think that's more important, my opinion, than what ends up happening with Amanda's future. Because the things that you have told me off camera and during this interview, I, I believe you first off, okay? But it sounds like a movie, right? Like this is not this is not ingrained in our brains that we think this sort of thing is normal. Okay. But who's to say that somebody doesn't hear your story and they're waking up sore and confused and off balance and going, Oh, I'm not crazy. Like this is happening to other people, you know? So I just commend you for doing so for putting your story out there. I know it's super hard and we both knew we didn't know what this was going to turn out to be. Right. I wasn't sure. You know, yeah. um, part of my hesitation is we can see, we know how evil and toxic some people in the crypto space are. Yeah. We also know that there's a lot of uh, people, not just in crypto, but in general who seek attention. Now, listen, I love going out on one of those tweets and, and, you know, wrecking somebody on a tweet and, and arguing and, and fighting. But when it comes to things like this, I don't want attention. I don't want sympathy ever. I also worry about, and like we've seen, you know, in the Zach community recently with Kenny who died yeah. and then came back to life. I never want somebody to think that I'm telling my story because I'm looking for help, whether it's monetary um, or anything, because I believe there's a woman I'm very close with on the trafficking side through the spaces who wants the guy Bill to set up a GoFundMe for all of us. I said, I want no part of it. She said, mm -hmm. well, why? You know, it can help us with lawyers. It's not. I said, because the minute we attach the request for money to our situation, it takes away from the, from the credibility of our situation. I will never do it. I wish it um, wasn't that way, but I think you're right. It Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, listen, I'm strapped. She drained me of about $17,000. Now, did she steal it from me? No, I did give it to her. But with her guilt, you know, oh, I don't have any money. And, you know, I'm back now in Florida and the doctor that I'm seeing doesn't give me Suboxone or Methadone. You know, it's not covered down here. I need money. But and I would always do it. Um, so I did it willingly, but she drained me. She destroyed everything in my home. You know, I would go, what they do as far as to isolate you is they don't want you to have nice stuff. My jewelry would go missing. My makeup would turn up missing or broken. My good clothes would be missing. You know, I look back at, she came back to visit in 2019 after she moved out and we went to New York City for Christmas Eve. And it was a spur of the moment thing. And I went into my closet. I'm like, where's all my good clothes? There was nothing there. She, we got to go. We got to go. Just take whatever. I look back at the photos of what I looked like. I mean, it's embarrassing what I was wearing, you know, mm -hmm. as we took photos on Christmas Eve. But this is what they want. They want to strip you of your self-confidence, your self-esteem. Um, they your want dignity. you to feel weak, your dignity. And by doing that, it also makes the average person look at me and say, she's not keeping up with herself. Yeah. Something is wrong with her. She's not taking care of herself. Is she fit? My father, I'll admit, my father still doesn't believe what happened. He still will not believe what happened. He thinks I'm crazy. He thinks Amanda is too stupid to accomplish something like this. Well, she's clearly not. She made it through, last I knew, she made it through nursing school. Yeah, she's which would be exactly what she would want your family to yes. think. Yes, yes. Yes. She actually told me and my family one day, um, she was drinking something and she put sugar in. And I said something about the sugar being fattening. She actually tried saying, and like a fool, I believed her. She goes, I didn't know she was, sugar was fattening. So what do you mean? Of course, you know, sugar was fattening. No, I didn't know sugar by itself was fattening. So these were the things that she would do to just kind of make people think that she was just very naive. Um, and, I, and I believed her and I wanted to believe her, you know, my seed phrases, my passwords, you know, people said to me, oh, well, how'd she manage to get into these accounts? Stupid me. 
I'd literally go to sleep sometimes at night and be like, please be careful with your lemonade because that's my password book right there. And if you spill it, I lose my passwords. You know, who does that? But I trusted her. Um, I did know that there were times that she hacked me and I justified it by saying, because her story when she met me was that her stepfather supposedly assaulted her when she was 19 um, and that she couldn't trust people and that her mother went back to him, even though her mother was supposed to love her. Mm. So anytime I knew that she was hacking me, I kind of wrote it off as, you know what? She doesn't know what it's like to have a good friend. She needs to know that she can trust me. Well, no, she was playing me all along. Um, and, you know, that's it's kind of the gist of it. You know, I did doc, I did download yesterday and I haven't told anybody this yet except my mom. I did download my hospital records from Waterbury Hospital from June 2nd, that very first day. And I'm reading the doctor's notes. He actually stated that when I went in, I claimed the assault happened eight days prior. No, I didn't. I was still bleeding. How was the assault eight days prior? I made it very clear that was how I woke up. So I was just done dirty every time. And every other time I went to the hospital, I asked for psych. Even before they mentioned it, I said, I would like to speak with a psychiatrist before the doctor comes in. Oh, well, why? Because I want it documented by psych that I'm okay. Every time I met with psych, they diagnosed me mentally stable. But yet every time the ER doctors chose to override that, I have paranoid and delusional. And this is a good one. Altered state of consciousness due to marijuana use. <laughs> I, at that point, wow. was only smoking CBD. I wasn't even smoking the actual THC marijuana. So they were using whatever they can. And I tried fighting the hospital to have my records revised. My thing is, how can an ER doctor override what psych says? You know, when you and I talked about that a little bit on a personal basis yesterday, too, because, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who has some familiar familiarity with that. I just don't understand how a general doctor can take it upon himself to override sight. To me, the psych diagnosis should be the diagnosis. And there was it's her specialty. Exactly. You know, it should be. And twice the psych doctor said I was mentally stable to have the exam kit done. But yet the ER doctor said I was not and refused to do it. And one of the last times, actually, it might have been the last time that I went, he actually said to me, if you keep fighting me for it, we're going to hold you in psych. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here, I, I think it was an Eddie Murphy. I think it was Eddie Murphy delirious years ago where he does this scene about how he goes upstairs crying. You know, I hate my parents. And then the mother, you know, and the mother yells, you know, oh, shut up. And now he's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, trying to hold it in. That was me. You know, I was yeah. so angry that I was trying to hold in my anger and my tears. And he's like, you either go home or we're putting you in psych. And that was it. And then I waited for the state's attorney when the state's attorney refused to do anything. And I just begged her. I said, please just process the evidence. And then you can say I'm crazy all you want. I even said to them, if nothing comes back with the evidence, lock me up. Mm -hmm. Put me in psych. Lock Prove me to up. me that I'm crazy. Yep. And my lawyer even said to her, please, I, I'm not going to say her name either, you know, please state's attorney, whatever, you know, can you please tell us what evidence or what you would have needed for probable cause? And she said it. And all the state's attorney kept saying is, well, there's just no probable cause. There's just no probable cause. How isn't there if there was DNA found in, in an exam kit? How wasn't there? How wasn't there if I have photos of my legs completely bruised up, which everyone has said are handprints. So to say that there was no probable cause Again, not for an arrest. I get that. But there was definitely probable cause to further investigate. And they yeah. refused to do so. That's when I decided I'm out of here. I can't be in this state anymore. I got to a point where I would have rather being assaulted than dealing with the police. And that's really sad. That is really sad. sad. Um, Waterbury PD failed me. And I do hope that there's some recourse I can take against them, as well as the two hospitals involved, Waterbury and uh, St. Mary's. I don't know what the statute of limitations is on that, um, but they failed me. you know. And if you read through the emails, which once I am fully public, I do think what I'll do is whether it's a website or something where I'm gonna post all these emails for people to see, 
So when you see the detective handling my case say on a couple of occasions that she's going to try and get the evidence processed, but then come back and say, well, we don't need it because we already have enough. But then to be told by the state's attorney, we don't, we don't have, have enough. enough. Yeah. Well, there was a breakdown somewhere and I was failed. And I said to the state's attorney, you have the power to fix the mistakes that were done, fix them. But nothing was done. So this did happen in multiple states. Um, I moved to Florida. My first priority is getting my life back on track. As you can see, you know, I'm up against a blank wall because I don't even have much furniture. I just left so much behind. I'm trying to start over. Um, so my first thing is increasing my income you know, expanding my career because I do work for myself. I work from home. So I'm looking to get my Florida real estate appraisal license here so I can do both states. And then as I'm financially back on my feet a little bit better, that's when I am going to start putting more of my focus back into the case. But right now I need to worry about staying mentally strong. I have to know, and I believe I do know, but I'm sure everyone else is going to ask the same question. Are you safe now? I think so. Okay. Um, no one ever knows. Um, there's a little bit of research if you want to look up uh, what a targeted individual is. Um, from what I have learned is once you are this deep in this life, you never get out. Um, do I have any reason to think anything has happened to me since I've been in this home? No, I do not. I feel completely safe. I go to sleep. I turn my lights off. You know, I'm not waking up, checking my body for bruises. So I think I'm okay. Okay. Um, but from what I have learned, I will most likely continue to be, I don't know if being followed is the right way, uh, right wording, but being monitored. Okay. I don't know if that's the case. Um, it is called a targeted individual. Now, targeting individuals can be a few things. There are a lot of people who believe that there's these, you know, technology weapons that are being used, which are things similar to things you can find like in the U.S. patents for things about MK Ultra. Um, I don't believe that that's necessarily anything that I'm involved with, but it still falls gotcha. under the whole targeting individual category, as well as gang stalking. You know, these people want to make you feel like you're always fighting. They want to make you feel angry. So I think I'm safe. Um, do I feel like if anything happened to me here, do I feel safe picking up the phone and calling 911? Not necessarily. Um, because if I try to tell the local police here what's been going on, would they then reach out to Waterbury? And would Waterbury say, oh, well, the girl's just crazy. Hmm. So that does scare me. I don't know how I would handle it if, God forbid, something happened again. I don't know. So let me ask you this. Um, one, all I can say is I'll be praying for you. But Thank two, you. we've talked about this a little bit off camera. Where do you go from here? Because we know there's going to be a lot of questions, right? And so this video is going to be public. People are going to watch it and you know, there'll be a lot of questions. So do you want to kind of go over kind of the next steps of what you're thinking through this process? Yeah, I think, you know, um, and just to kind of touch on it too, when I wanted to speak with you yesterday, it was more because I was worried. I was originally going to talk about the story as someone I know. Mm -hmm. And I was really worried that I would slip and say me or I. So I was like, you know what, let me just have a one on one with Josh, give him a quick rundown as to what's going on so he can understand we may need to edit things out. Mm -hmm. And then I was it's really fair. shocked. And I have to say, so appreciative that you chose to want to take this down this road, you know, down this road. Um, because usually, you know, Crypto Bros podcast, you know, it's um, they're more uplifting. Lighthearted. They're, yeah, they're more fun. And uh, it wasn't a direction I thought you would want to take it. So when you made that offer, like, listen, you know, maybe this is the right time um, for you to speak out. Instantly, I said, you know what? It is because I've been considering doing it on my other profile. And like I said to you, I use that other profile and you were like, Rudy, you have such a distinctive voice. If I ever went into that space and heard you speak, I would, you know, how would, you I anyway? would be DMing your other profile so, going, hey, you got multiple personality yes. there with that two profiles. Exactly. It's the same and person. Plus it's a YOLO, it's a YOLO um, anti-trafficking zombie PFA, mm. you know, so it, it totally gives it away. And, you know, that's, I got to say, you know, YOLO and her dad have known about this for quite some time. And, you know, she's a young girl. 
And mm -hmm. her support has just been amazing. You know, I shot her a DM last night saying that I think I was doing this today. And she was just so compassionate. And, you know, you got to do it for other people. And that's what this is about for me. Because like you said, people will hear this and go, oh, my God, is that what's happening to me? I've already found three people this way. Not only that, but let's put our stories together. Did somebody that's going through this also know a flight attendant? Did it also happen in the same state? If this is a very large ring, chances are people I'm going to encounter are going to be involved with the same ring. Putting sure. stories together, we'll figure that out. So my next step, um, you know, after talking to you as well, I think that the best thing will be to put together a Twitter space. Um, we're... I can, because there's a lot of things I don't want to touch on now that are more on the technology side, yep. because I would like to have somebody with that technology expertise with me to be able to confirm that these things can be done the way I think. So I would like to do a space and have a couple of those people with that technology knowledge up there. Um, it'll most likely be, you know, Bill Elmore has offered mm -hmm. to host or co-host the space for me. And I would possibly, you know, whether it's somebody like Holly or somebody else deep in the crypto community who know what trolls not to bring up, yeah. I would like to have another co-host who would really be able to say, okay, well, that's so-and-so. We definitely don't want to bring him up to ask questions. Um, but and like I think you were saying, you, sure. yeah, you want questions I because absolutely want you questions. were wanting to head this thing off. And that was one of the things that I thought you were extremely brave for whenever you said that, yeah, you know, I think I do want to share the story because I had told you that's completely up to you. Like this conversation can be sealed away and we will, nobody needs to know, but you wanted to come out and do that. But you are aware that some people may have doubts. Some people may have just genuine questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know you well enough to know that if somebody, if this resonates with someone and they are starting to realize that, oh, wait a second, that sort of thing is happening with me, that they can reach out to you and you will talk to them about that. I mean, that's the whole point of all this. Not only and, will I talk to them, but I will give them the resources right. that they need to be able to be heard. Because I know that you have been worried about people thinking it's an attention thing or any, right. you don't want the monetary part of it. But from talking to you through this interview and off camera, I am 100% sure that it's more about helping people than it is anything else. And I just hope that that comes through. But I think being transparent enough that where you do do some sort of a space um, with, I forgot the guy's name, um, somebody that's yeah. an expert in it, Bill, that people can ask questions and if nothing else can become more educated on it to look Absolutely. at some of the signs. And I don't know, once this once this is posted, can people still comment? Even though it's not live, can people put comments yes. or you have comments off? You nope. know, I would love if people do comment. I would love to be able to answer those questions as well, whether it's me or giving you the answers. There's nothing that's off limits. And that's- No, if someone comments on the video, Rudy, you can, if you have a YouTube account, you can comment right underneath it. Okay. You can respond to them, so. Because that's, uh, that's important. You know, there's a lot of questions that people will have and yes, my main goal is helping others. However, selfishly, I also want to be able to stick that middle finger up to the hospital and to the police. I need, I need to feel like I've been vindicated and I, as childish as it sounds, want to be able to say, I effing told you so. It's very important for me for the police to feel like they messed up. Whether they'll Fair ever enough. admit it or not, I need to know that one day they say, holy crap, everything she said was true and we dropped the ball. And that's very important to me. Well, I just commend you for having the courage to come forward and share your story. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that the, the strength that it takes to do that, if anybody has ever put themselves or would try to put themselves in that situation, they have to acknowledge the strength that that would take. And so I, one, want to say that I appreciate that people will get the information. They will do with the information what they want to do with it. But as long as people are being truthful and people are having conversations, it's the only way to educate to bring this thing back around. We have to 
be able to have these conversations. So I know you were worried about, you know, us being more lighthearted and things like that. But part of the reason that we have this as a standalone in the crypto bros realm or brand or whatever you want to call it is so that we can talk about anything. Like, you know what you're getting when you come to the podcast. And when with this, you'll be able to know what you're getting when it comes to the title of the video. So I commend you, Rudy. You know my heart. I think we've known each other for a long enough time, but I can tell you that I love you and I'll Thank be praying you. for you. And if and by you, the way, I do have pants on, you know, Greg said I didn't have to wear them, <laughs> but I did want to let you know, you know, I, I thank you for doing that. So we can <laughs> end this with a smile because, um, you know, it's a heavy topic. It really is. It, there's a lot there. And and sometimes we try to get away from the heaviness of reality, but sometimes we need to be smacked in the face with it. And so when you were telling me your story yesterday, you know, we've had the interview scheduled for a while. It, it just it just made sense. Like, hey, let's get it out there. Let's do it, and, and then know you. that you have. I'm glad. I was hoping, Rudy, that for your sake, by the end of this, you would feel like there was a little bit of a weight lifted off your shoulder. Well, it's done. You know, for two years, it's been yeah. well more than two years now. You know, it's been. I want to go public. I want to say something, but is it the right time? I don't want to be seen this way. For a while, it was more, I don't want to jeopardize the case, you know, um, while the case was still open. But at this point, like I said, you know, all it takes is one space or one video for that one lawyer or that one FBI agent or CIA agent, somebody to say, this girl needs help. She yeah. needs to be heard. And I do believe that that will eventually happen. Well, um, and so what we'll I do, thank- Rudy... Oh, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity um, and for believing me. Um, this is what's needed, you know, um, and this is also why, because I respect you and your overall podcast. It's also why I kind of wanted to leave certain things out. Um, yeah. I don't want to make certain accusations that maybe shouldn't be made without proof. Um, I also don't want to get into too many of the conspiracy type theories that I can't back up. Um mm-hmm. You know, so I tried to remain as respectful, you know, towards you and, you know, your brand also. I get it. And I appreciate that. Um, I just want you to know that you, I think you know that all of our DMs are open if you ever needed any of that. I actually was unaware until yesterday that you could make a phone call from X. My phone starts (laughs) ringing and I was like, "How, how did this work? And I just slid it over like a normal phone call, and there it's, it is. So it's, it's that's great. amazing. I yeah. think it can be used worldwide too. I, yes. I believe we can use it worldwide. So it's so pretty cool. Anytime you need to reach out, reach out. I mean, I think you and know you. that already. But um, and if I you'd like to we'll, revisit this at a later date, you know, absolutely. You know, exactly what I was thinking is as this process moves on. Now that your story's out there, I have a feeling that you're going to get bombarded with a, just a lot of questions and in the spaces when it comes to human trafficking, maybe we revisit this in a month or so, maybe whatever that looks like with your case. If it, if it gets to a certain point where we want to touch base with a lot of other questions already answered at that time, then we could have more of a general discussion of the human trafficking crisis too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause that's what this started out to be until we talked yesterday. So, but I, I, again, I have to say, I thank you. And I appreciate you having the courage to do this. I feel in my heart that there is someone that's going to see this, that you are going to make a huge difference in their life because it's going to make sense to them now. And the only way that happened is through that courage that you showed. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm thanking you from me and those other people that are going to um, realize this makes sense. So thank you very much. I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate your brothers. I appreciate Holly. You know, I love what you guys were do- are doing. So I really thank you for giving me this opportunity. Anytime. You're welcome.
subscribe.